know to be on your best behavior that everything will be recorded uh, so, so that uh, people can uh, can listen to it at home some some people can't zoom from their old computers but would like uh, to 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 follow the worship and the sermon so Ali is going to record everything let us begin by listening to the choir Oh no. huge thank you to the choir but we really are uh, waiting to listen to you in the flesh once more let us recollect ourselves and say the versicles remember jesus christ risen from the dead he is our salvation our eternal glory if we die with him we shall live with him if we endure we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he keeps faith. For he has broken the power of death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And Derek will now lead us in our first Amen. hymn. Each faithful vow, 
light and hope of Christ's resurrection, let us draw near to our Lord, who is full of compassion and mercy. Like Mary at the empty tomb, we fail to grasp the wonder of your presence. Lord, have mercy. Like the disciples behind locked doors, we are afraid to be seen as your followers. Christ, have mercy. And like Thomas in the upper room, we are slow to believe. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is the resurrection and the life, raise us who trust in him from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. Mm -hmm that we may seek those things which are above, where he reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. They devoted themselves to the apostles. Okay, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, 
to the breaking of bread and the prayers, all came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Here ends the reading. So let us say the psalm together. I will say the odd verses. Would you please answer with the even ones? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Nigel. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Suffer with the Lord below. They reign. 
wit and their joy to know the mystery of his love. The cross he bore is life and health, though shame and death to him. His people's hope, his people's wealth, their everlasting theme. In the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I would like to focus on one sentence often overlooked. Um, Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. This is strange, isn't it? The Good Shepherd. It's one of the better known passages of the gospel and yet the disciples, the apostles, were baffled by it. So let's try to understand why, uh, because it's not conceptually difficult to understand, so why did they not understand? Why were they baffled, as the Greek text says? This gospel was actually the gospel for my first Sunday here at St Luke's. Um, it was perhaps unfortunate that my first sermon here should have concerned itself with misunderstanding, but there you are, the liturgy would have it. I think this segment of John's Gospel is often misunderstood because most clergy and definitely all Bible scholars are blind to the presence of humour in uh, the Gospels. And if there is an often overlooked dimension in Jesus's teaching, it is humor, a little bit of sarcasm sometimes. The church has always been frightened of it, you know. You can't make fun of God, you can't have fun with God, you can't laugh at the commandments, and you certainly cannot find the Bible ridiculously incomprehensible or funny in places. And yet Jesus did. Now, I don't mean to say that the Gospels are some ancient version of private eye, but there is actually quite a bit of derision, derision going on in places for those who know where to look. Our Lord uh, was a master of debate. He didn't let himself be boxed in a tight corner without a fight. Why? He even caught Satan at his own game when they were debating in the desert. And after all, Jesus coined some of the most famous pieces of prevarication ever written, you know, such as render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. Uh, but the trouble was Caesar was supposed to be a God and the God of Israel was supposed to reign supreme over his people. So Jesus often left to his listeners the care of figuring out who gets what. Or think of the time when some asked by whose authority he was teaching. He said to them, I will also ask you a question and you tell me, did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? Then the Pharisees discussed among themselves, saying, hmm, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, the people will stone us, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered him, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. It was truly with him, as is said in the Psalms, with the pure, God shows himself pure, but with the crooked, he shows himself crooked. Jesus did not always play fair, although he once said, of course, let your yes be yes and your no, no, he could be less than clear when necessity called for it, uh, so much so that his followers frequently misunderstood him. I don't know if you know this show, but do you watch this country? No? 
I could ask for a show of hands. Well, you should. It's one of the funniest pieces of telly um, in, in, uh, in recent memory. Uh, the heroine there, Kerry Mucklow, says that Jesus was massively sarcastic from time to time, you know. Well, especially when he was given the five loaves and the two fish and just like, oh, what do you expect me to do with this? And it sounds absurd. And many people were quite upset by this. I think the BBC got many complaints. But actually, Jesus often used a very similar brand of derision. If you remember the story of the blind man in the gospel, um, he, was, he had been screaming and shouting for so long that everyone was bothered and they begged Jesus to do something about it. The disciples even tried to silence him. But when he was allowed near Jesus to do, uh, Jesus asked him, so what do you want? Um, what could he possibly have wanted? Now, imagine this to be delivered with a, a bit humorously, would it not have produced laughter from bystanders and even from the blind man himself don't all know what he wants. He was shouting like a banshee a few moments before, Lord, let me see. Um, so Jesus did not expect the poor man to earnestly answer. He was playing uh, with the crowd and with everyone and building tension for the sheer wonder of the miracle that would follow so that the blind man himself will shout in delight, never since the beginning of the world has anyone done anything like this. It's our slightly over-serious image of Jesus that blinds us to humour in the Gospels. And there is humour in the text today. The brand of it is a bit darker. Um, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. So bafflement again. Um, he said that he was the good shepherd, that, then that he was the lamb of God, and now the gate to the sheepfold. What can he possibly mean? And no one knew for sure. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. I think we're in the presence of a, oh, he can't possibly mean that kind of joke, the kind of humor that wreaks havoc on the respect we have for reputable figures like religious figures and monarchs and grandparents, for instance. To give you another example, I think I may have told this story, but um, before, a, a long time ago, that is to say when I was a little child, my uh, smaller brother was very badly told off for talking with his mouth full of food at table too sternly really and he was sobbing away when my grandmother who was a tediously respectable elderly lady suddenly opened her mouth when neither of my parents were looking so that my brother could see the huge lump of half chewed broccoli and mash that she'd kept in to comfort him and with that little bit of humor my little brother was comforted now this brand of fun only works when you're so utterly respectable and so utterly proper that eating with your mouth open is so out of character, it's baffling. Like say our queen nibbling on KFC chicken wings and then wiping her fingers on her dress for want of a bib, that kind of humor. I would like to suggest that in this gospel, we see the patriarchs suffering a similar fall from respectability. All who came before me were thieves and bandits, Jesus said. And who could these have been? Um, are we talking about false messiahs here? That is what most tedious Bible scholars assume. But you know, these were not shepherds. The simile wouldn't work. Uh, but let me see. Abraham was a shepherd. So was Isaac and Jacob and Moses, and most obviously King David, and quite a few of the prophets, shepherds, all of them. And Jesus really said, all who came before me were thieves and bandits, and the sheep did not listen to them. So I fear our Lord was insinuating that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and the rest of the kings and prophets were all thieves. He's using 
humour to shock his listeners. He is saying something quite disrespectful to comfort them. He can't possibly have a go at Moses, can he? He doesn't mean to say the patriarchs are robbers, does he? Oh, but he does. At the very least, he is deliberately ambiguous. His audience were simple Jewish folks. Um, the stories told about Moses and the patriarchs were stories from the Torah they heard proclaimed in their synagogues in a strange ancient language. They were told in, in classical Hebrew. This is why Christ said that the sheep did not recognize their voice, but he spoke the language of the people. His hearers were constantly rebuked and told off as a stiff-necked and disobedient flock by the Pharisees and by the rabbis, but he says they can recognize a voice that rings true when they hear it. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from them because they do not know the voice of strangers. These were thieves because God is the only shepherd, and they and their descendants who claim to speak in his name have set themselves up as pastors of a flock that never really belonged to them. They were mere hard hands, Jesus said elsewhere. Moses and the others were bandits, come only to destroy, at least in the way they were preached in the synagogues of his day. But I have come that you may have life, and life abundantly. St. Paul will unpack this, you know, in his letters. He says virtually the same thing in his letter to the Romans. No human being will be made just in the sight of God by observances prescribed by the law of Moses. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come through Abraham and his descendants because of the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the followers of the law who are to be his heirs, then faith is null and the promise is void. But when there is no law, there is no violation. That is the fourth chapter of the letter to the Romans. Jesus today, like, like then, only asks of us that we should follow him and trust him. Even if we dislike what was said previously, even, even if we cannot understand what was said, even if we did not observe the commandments of the law, we need only trust him. We may not have understood what God wanted previously, but now God is talking our language. He is showing his love and his care for us in a body just like ours. The other shepherds were thieves and bandits, come only to destroy the sheep, but the good shepherd would come and be killed for his flock, that they may have life and have it abundantly. So what Jesus said to his first century Jewish audience still rings true, you know. Many people, yes, even in the church, have made religion very demanding, a matter of obedience and compliance, something that destroys. But it is life-giving. It is a simple matter of faith and trust. Amen.
spirit and in unison with Christ let us pray to the Father. Psalm 23 and today's hymn urge us in death's dark veil I fear no ill with thee dear Lord beside me thy rod and staff my comfort still thy cross before to guide me. In these deeply challenging and uncharted times let us pray first of all for those families who have lost a loved one and for those who are ill. We pray from the bottom of our hearts that the Lord will be with you and will comfort you. We pray also for all those who are vulnerable in the widely different circumstances in which this can occur, and for those who are anxious at this time, including because of uncertainty of employment. We face huge challenges going forward, we pray that those in authority act wisely and openly in making the difficult decisions needed on behalf of the whole community. We pray also for the work of the scientists and researchers across the world seeking to understand the virus and to develop practical long-term solutions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. While we are facing huge challenges, let us also recognize and give thanks for the blessings we really can see among us at this time. The care and dedication of the NHS, the care workers, and the people in so many essential sectors who are putting their needs, putting their need, our needs before theirs. For the renewed sense of community the crisis has engendered, in our own community, where people are reaching out to support each other, nationally and increasingly across the world. Let us pray that as this crisis eases, we never forget this sense of community and interconnectedness. Let us also pray that these extraordinary times lead to deep and necessary changes to how our world works addressing the many profound and deep injustices which currently exist. Lord, we pray that we may all play our part in this. Within our own community, we pray this week for Home Start, who have a crucial role in supporting families at the moment. We also pray that Glass Doors prompt action in getting its homeless into accommodation for the virus may lead to lasting improvements in their lives. And among local churches, we pray for St. Mark's Battersea Rise this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Give them courage in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray particularly today 
for Sarah Jane Staines and anyone known to us who is ill, and for their families and friends who love, care and support them. We also remember those who have died in the faith of Christ. According to your promises, grant us with them a share in your kingdom. We pray in particular today for all those who have died during this pandemic. We also pray for Clive Fogarty and for Eustace Crawford. Eustace and Carmel and their family have been worshipping at St Luke's for 50 years. As one member of the congregation said, Eustace will be much missed in our pews. We also pray for their families, friends and communities, that they may draw comfort from your support at this painful time of grieving. Merciful Father, accept these Set prayers these for, for the sake, sake of your yours. dear Son, our Amen. Saviour, Jesus Christ. is left is for me to wish you a very good week and um, also to give you one little notice a nice one uh, that a, a date has been set for young he's licensing as associate minister at St Luke's and that's the 7th of June we don't know how, which form it will take whether we'll have to do this online whether I, but um, so let it be in your diaries on the 7th of June we will have an associate minister let us pray for a blessing upon each other. Let us pray for each other. May Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill us with his new life. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us this Easter tide and always. Amen.